question. So let's get that one done now, and we'll go right into today's lesson. A hypothetical study shows of 45 swimmers found that those who were placed on a weight training program in addition to daily swimming workouts improved their times by 3.5%. Is this study an observational study or an experiment? If it is an experiment, describe the treatment and control groups and discuss whether single or double blinding is needed. <coughs> if it's observational, state whether the case is controlled, and if so, which are the cases and which are the controls? You know the drill. Stop and start. Okay, so it's an experiment because the weight training and the control groups are those who did weight train and those who did not. There's no way the experiment was blind because it's pretty obvious who's lifting the weights and who is not lifting the weights. So what do we talk about now? We're going to talk about survey and opinion polls <clears throat> and making sense of them and, and determining their validity and so on and so forth. Now it starts with this thing called the margin of error. And you'll hear this constantly during political polls where they'll say such and such a poll from Quinnipiac or um, Rasmussen or CNN <clears throat> that these polls have a margin of two and a half percent plus or minus two and a half percent something like that. Um, the margin of error is used to describe a confidence interval that is likely co to contain the true population parameter. The confidence interval um, is an interval in which we expect our conclusion is valid. So it always goes from, and then whatever you think the statistic is, minus the margin of error, to whatever you think the statistic is, <clears throat> plus the margin of error. So, like, let's say that you thought it was a 51% chance that a particular candidate was going to win office, but there was a 3% um, uh, margin of error, we would say that the, the probability goes from 48 to 54, or it's 48% um, uh, pardon me, 51% plus or minus a margin of error of 3%. So let's give you an example here. Ready? <clears throat> the following states both the sample statistic and the margin of error find the confidence interval and express uh, and answer the additional question. A poll is conducted the day before an election for a United States representative. There are only two candidates running, and the poll shows that 48.5% of the voters surveyed favor the Democratic candidate. With a margin of error of two percentage points based on this poll, should the Democratic candidate expect to lose the election? Why or why not? <clears throat> well, that's a really interesting question, I think, because they don't mention if there are any undecideds. Now, my guess is that the intent behind this question is that there are no undecideds. So assuming that, then what we can say for sure is that if we assume 51.5% would have voted Republican, which is the case if 48.5% vote Democrat, then there is still a chance that the Democratic candidate could win because um, he could go up two points, which brings him to 50.5 points, and the Republican could go down two points, which brings him to 49.5 points. So <clears throat> we're not sure. The margin of error here is that... Um, you could be from 46.5 to 50.5. And if you get 50.5% and there's only two candidates and everybody's decided, then you could squeak out a win. So it's not a guarantee that you would lose, though it suggests that you would lose. All right. Should you believe a statistical study? That's what we're going to talk about now. And a lot of it has to do with, with its methodology. Now, there are some guidelines that we have to go by, and the very first guideline is you have to identify the goal, the population, and the kind of study that you are dealing with, okay? Now, <clears throat> a newspaper reports researchers gave each of the 100 participants their astrological horoscopes. They asked them whether the horoscopes appeared to be accurate. 85% of the participants reported that the horoscopes were indeed accurate. The researchers concluded that horoscopes are valid most of the time. Analyze this according to guideline one. Well, think about it. You're looking for a goal, a population, and a type of study. <clears throat> Doing your stop and start here. Okay, so the goal is to determine if horoscopes are accurate. The population is people who read horoscopes. Now, you might have said, well, it's the 100 participants. Well, those that's the sample. 
right? Those are the ones they questioned. But this pertains to anyone who reads their horoscope. And the type of study, it's observational. It's not experimental. You're looking back and seeing if the horoscope was accurate. Which, by the way, horoscopes are a joke and they're never accurate. But if you want to believe, you can feel free to believe. They just write the things in such a vague way that pretty much anything is going to be accurate. So there's no meaning behind there. <clears throat> Show me the horoscope that says what the lotto numbers are. Now we're talking. All right. All right. Next example. Based solely on the information given, decide whether you have any reason to doubt the results of the study below. An experimental double-blind study finds that people who eat more fast foods are more likely to feel tired throughout the day. Think about that. Is there any reason to doubt the results of the study? <coughs> well, how can a study be experimental and double-blind? That's the big question I have. If, if it's experimental in this case, it's pretty obvious who is being fed more fast food. Now, it can be, it, you can have an experimental um, uh, study and, and have a double blind when you're getting something like a medication or just general food, but, and you don't know what the, the food conditions are, like maybe you're going under a particular diet. But when you are being fed more fast food, you're going to know which group you're in. And if you're not being fed fast food, then you're not going to know what group you are in. All right. So to me, that's pretty fishy. Ah, <laughs> get it? Fishy. Anyway, <clears throat> so we've talked about the guideline of identifying a goal, the population, and the type of study. We also need to make sure that we consider the source. Based solely on the information given below, decide whether you have reason to doubt the results of the study. A study financed by a major pharmaceutical company finds that the new drug is no more effective against the high blood pressure than the older, less expensive drug. Well, the financer is likely to have a monetary interest in the outcome. So <clears throat> did the major pharmaceutical company, was that the company that owned the less expensive drug? What, where does the pharmaceutical company fit in here? It reminds me years ago, there was this uh, oil spill in Alaska with the Exxon Valdez. And I saw this wonderful program that made Alaska look so pristine and had recovered fully from the catastrophe but being a fly fisherman i'm connected to the environmental interest world and at the end it said produced by the exxon mobile oil company and it was like well of course they're going to make it look good they don't want to come out and say oh we really ruined this place so you got to consider the source <clears throat> next identify the goal population type of study done that we've talked about considering the source now we need to look for bias in a sample now, there are two types of bias. The first type of bias is a selection bias, and the second type is a participation bias. And by the way, I wanted to mention to you that it would be a really good time to take photographs of the screens to put in that album if you want to remember these definitions. Selection bias <coughs> is the bias introduced by the selection of individuals, groups, or data for analysis in such a way that proper randomization is not achieved thereby failing to ensure that the sample obtained is representative of the population intended to be analyzed. Just a quick idea. Let's say we're going to do a study about who makes better hockey players, uh, the United States or Canada. And let's say <clears throat> that this study was done a while ago and the Canadians selected were Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, um, I think Chris Chelios was an American, but they went through and they picked the best Canadian players in the world at that time. And then me, I played hockey. All right, I stunk. I was nowhere near. You can't even it's, it can't even mention me in the in the breadth of those other ones. But if you chose a bunch of club hockey players, which is what I was, <clears throat> if you chose a club hockey player in America to compare to a world class player, all star from Canada, that's a selection bias. Now there's also a thing called the participation bias. Or it's also called a non-response bias. It's a phenomenon in which the results of elections, studies, polls, etc. become non-representative. In other words, it doesn't represent the truth because the, the participants disproportionately possess certain traits that would affect the outcome. This trait means the sample is systematically different from the target population, resulting in biased estimates. A great example of this is, let's say we were, we were going to look for the winner of a presidential election, and you only 
had your poll made up of white people or oriental people or african-american people or latin people each culture can have their own favorite candidate and your poll needs to mix all of those together here's an example in the 1936 presidential election there was a literary digest poll the question who will win fdr or landon the result of the poll easy win for landon result of the election landslide for fdr why the discrepancy bias where do you find bias in something like this what what might be the bias in this kind of poll well literary digest people are going to poll people who read the literary digest and the literary digest um are people who are well read now <clears throat> i'm not taking anything for or against fdr's um results here but i'm going to tell you a little secret about fdr he he is one of the big reasons he didn't create but he absolutely escalated the practice of the government collecting tax dollars and then giving them to particular voting groups to win their vote at the election um here's an example that happened in new york state many years ago when uh mario cuomo was governor not his son mario cuomo wanted the teachers union to endorse him and he wanted to borrow some money from their retirement fund so from the general tax dollars that came in, he created this thing called excellence in teaching money, and he gave money to every teacher in the state of New York. Well, <laughs> who do you think they're going to vote for? Likewise, FDR made it a practice of creating legislation that handed money out to particularly important voting blocks. Now, I don't know that this voting block would or it suggests that this voting block or other blocks, there were many of them, were not readers of the Literary Digest. Um, instead, they lived their own lifestyle, but um, they were not sampled in the Literary Digest poll, so the results were different than were thought. Another example, based solely on the information given, decide whether you think, uh, whether you have any reason to doubt the results of the study. In trying to determine whether their candidate for governor has a chance of defeating the incumbent Democrat, the Republican Party conducts a survey of its members selected at random. <clears throat> okay, assuming your stop and start time is over. Um, <laughs> this is absurd because you're asking only Republican Party members. You need to make sure that you ask just as many proportionally Democrat members. For example, if you live in an area that's 70% Democrat and 30% Republican, then you should poll 70% Democrats and 30% Republicans. If it's 50-50, you should poll 50-50. And if it's 80% Republican and 20% Democrat, you should poll 80% Republican to 20% Democrat. Um, if you have that kind of a systematic breakdown or a systemic breakdown, then your poll really isn't worth much. Okay. Now we get to the fourth guideline. We have identify the goal population type. Be careful of that source. Look for bias. Now, look for problems in defining or measuring the variables of interest. So, for instance, a researcher was interested in the exercise habits of the residents of the village of Pine Heights. She interviewed every 10th person who left the post office until she had interviewed 100 people. Each of the people interviewed was asked to rate their exercise level according to the following scheme. Very little, some, moderate, a lot, extensive. The researcher reported that on average, the residents of Pine Heights exercise moderately. Well, the problem is that these are ambiguous terms. You don't really know. I mean, some if you're an Olympic athlete, if you are getting a decent amount of exercise, you're exercising for hours a day. <clears throat> if you are someone who doesn't exercise much, you might go, oh my God, that's 20 minutes worth of exercise. <sighs> I'm out of breath. So it's such a, a vague notion, an undefined, ambiguous notion, that it doesn't work. Now, <clears throat> a good poll would say something like this. Very little, less than 10 minutes a day. Some, 10 to 20 minutes a day. Moderate, 20 to 40 minutes a day. A lot, 40 to 60 minutes a day. Extensive, more than an hour a day. A new fifth guideline coming out now, in addition to the goal, the population, the source, bias, problems, and definition. Watch out for confounding variables. Now, what is a confounding variable? It's also called a confounder or a confounding factor. It's a third variable in a study examining a potential cause and effect relationship. 
A confounding variable is related to both the supposed cause and the supposed effect, and that can help you or make you go to the wrong conclusion. For instance, an educational researcher wishes to compare the effectiveness of two different math textbooks. She has 10th graders at one school use the first book for one year and 10th graders at another school use the second textbook for one year. At the end of the year, she gives the same math test to both classes and compares the results. What are the confounding variables in this study? Well, there could be a lot of them, but one of them is how committed a district is to high achievement. I taught for years on Long Island in New York, and there was one particular school district that wasn't very committed to education. A couple of them I can think of. And <clears throat> um, their district was constantly under government supervision to try to get it to improve its scores. Now, another district, like I can think of, of Herrick's off the top of my head, or other ones where education is everything, then those people, if, if, if you don't get a 90, the parents are very, very, very upset. They expect you to go to an Ivy League school. So if you gave the same textbook, or I should say different textbooks to the two districts, you might say, oh, well, the reason is the textbook. Not necessarily. The reason could be the population and their concern for education in each district. All right, we're going to stop there and then pick up with the next video as we're just about out of memory.